You are now you entering, are now entering preform. preform. Prepare to Prepare perform. To perform. A podcast created to explore the inner workings of high-profile performers. performers. Conversations reveal what separates them from the average human. Buckle up. Buckle up. Jamie Archer is a former Royal Marines commando, musculoskeletal osteopath, and strength conditioning specialist. He draws upon 30 years of experience as a tactical athlete and osteopath to support and treat his clients. They may span from a wide variety of performance domains, but all of whom share the same mindset. Without further ado, here is our conversation on Preform. I left school at 15 and um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So um, I was always attracted to physical things, but things that really challenged me physically. So I'd already got a, I've got a black belt in karate at 15. I really enjoyed that. and. Um, I went down the careers office with my dad. We took a few days off school to go down and just, I wanted to join the Royal Air Force. I wanted to be a physical training instructor. And um, we went down on a Wednesday um, and uh, we went in, but the, the, what I didn't know was in the military in the UK, a Wednesday afternoon is where they all have a sports afternoon. So they'll disappear and play sports. So the, uh. the Royal Air Force guy wasn't there. So uh, the person that was there though was the Marines guy. <laughs> So, classic uh yeah classic yeah so um it wasn't long before i was they had a pull-up bar over the stairwell so i think i'd done about maybe five pull-ups and they said yeah you know you're, you're fit enough do you want to try for the selection um i just looked at my dad and he said well you know do you want to have a go and i said well, yeah i'll have a go so i had to go down to the commando training center which is in exeter in the uk and uh, it's a three-day course where they basically thrash you around to see who's left standing at the end. And um, I, I was still standing at the end. In fact, I've got, I've got a superior pass for that. And I was 15 years old. Wow. Um, so we had to do a number of uh, physical things. Uh, there was some endurance course stuff, um, some mind, sort of playing with your mind type stuff mm -hmm. um, to see whether you were going to quit really easily. Anyway, I passed that and they accepted me for training. And to cut a long story short, I did the, the, the Royal Marines training and then passed out as a, as a Royal Marines commando at 16 and then wow. found myself in a, in a commando unit um, still at 16 um, for, you know, four months before I turned 17. And then off, off it went and I spent 10 years as a, as a Royal Marines commando. And we went. Um, all over, you know, we went, we operated in the Arctic, so extreme cold. We went to the deserts, we operated in the jungle, and then we had active service in, in other places. And, uh, and I enjoyed that, you know, mm. it was extreme. And, but what the Marines taught me, which is something that's always is something that has stayed with me is when you think you're done, you're not done, you know, there's always a bit more and, I still have that now. I think it's maybe stubbornness. It doesn't have to be physical. It could be, it could be, a, if I get my teeth into something, I just, I've got to keep going. Um, and they teach you that. They teach you that it's probably the same in all military and, 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 and things like that. It was, it was just that sort of idea of just um, adapting to your environment and just cracking on, you know. And the big thing in the Royal Marines actually is having a sense of humor. It was always, you know, um, sort of, you know, finding the funny side of things there's a dark humor right in, yeah I imagine as it probably is in the military so that was it I did 10 years I was I carried on with my athletics because I was a I was an athletics youth champion before I went in and then I became the Royal Marines 400 meter champion the Royal Navy 400 meter champion and then traveled around for about a year competing mm. as a as a track and field athlete and I love that yeah I love that what was it like being so young? And I mean, this is an assumption, but I'd imagine your counterparts when you were 16, 17, starting off were quite older than you, correct? You were kind of an anomaly in those units? 
Yeah, um, yeah, they were. They were. They they seemed really old, but they were probably in their mid twenties. So it was like really old for me because I've right. been I've been at school a few months before, you know, sitting in class, mm-hmm. and um, and now I was, and I wasn't treated as a as I was treated as an equal. You know, mm-hmm. I had to do what they did. It, it didn't. When I look back at it, because it's like thirty years ago now, but when I look back, I think. I didn't really notice the difference to be honest, because I just thought I was as good as they were. And Mm. um, I I had this sort of supreme confidence in my physical ability that whatever they threw at me, because I just thought, well, loads of other people have done it. Why not me? If you can do it, I can do it. And that was it. So some of the things that were difficult in a sense were the, the admin. So, um, before I went, my mum taught me how to iron because there's a big thing in the military looking after your kit, you know, getting your kit squared away mm-hmm. and wasting time doing admin. So the, the lads that couldn't wash, there were no washing machines. We all had to do it by hand. So we all had to make our beds. Um, they were sort of, you know, hospital corners and things. So have you seen Full Metal Jacket? It's not as I severe have, of as course. that. It's not as <laughs> severe as that. You know, okay. It wasn't as severe as that, but. We did have to make bed blocks. We had to have kit musters and we had to, you know, be up at two in the morning with all our kit on the parade square and then it had to be somewhere else. But so that was a little bit of the mind stuff. But Mm -hmm. my mum taught me how to iron, which is a massive thing, Um, how to wash uh, my kit. I knew because I'd been in the cadets. I'd I'd spent a little bit of time in the the air cadets Mm because I I was going to join the Royal Air Force. So I knew how to polish my boots. I knew how to shape berets and things so i saw maybe a slightly step ahead there so but i didn't feel that phase i just knew i was going to do it and, and nothing was going to stop me because you know that's what i said i was gonna i was gonna do really so um and there were, there were i think there was about 55 of us that joined and then at the, at the end of the original um guys there was about i think about 11 of us 12 of us um that passed out. Um, so we did our what's called the commando tests, which are a series of physical tests all back to back within a week. And I passed all those um, first time. And um, one of the tests is called the is called the Tarzan assault course, where you're swinging through the trees and that. And um, the time that I did, um, I was looking back at this the other day. The time that I did, because you're given a certain amount of time, I think it's 13 minutes. But I did it in nine minutes, which is still up. I still think it's up. It's up there in maybe. You've the got top the record. 10. No, I haven't got the record. The record's oh. quicker than that, but I think oh. it's in the top ten. But oh. I have a photograph of of my name on the board saying uh, "Recruit Archer, nine minutes something um, Tarzan Assault Call." So it's like it's there, you know. It's That's not fantastic. like I made it up. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so we did all that, and then off we went to commando units, and then you know that was the life of a, of a marine. this might be a bit of a loaded question jamie but what was one of the greatest lessons that you learned in those 10 years of being in the marines i think probably like i said it's just that it's got to be the attitude really it's just that you know you 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 can do more than you think you can i think you know we Mm -hmm. were always very much when i left and i became a civilian i was initially i was a bit like Oh, well, I mean, these guys are just giving up left, right, and centre. What's going on? You know, <laughs> it's like as soon as it gets a bit hard, everyone just quits. Right. Because um, they didn't have that sort of, they weren't that wasn't sort of installed into them, and that's what got me. I think probably at a very young age. So I, I bring that into my own training now. I mean, I, I train every day. You know, mm-hmm. I work out, I keep fit. Uh, it's an important part of my life. Um, I work with athletes. Uh, I help out with people that want to get into the military, particularly elite military units, like whether it's the Marines or Special Forces. I, um, whether it's in business, my own business, you know, you've just got to put that, put the work in. So I'm, I, I can work hard, um, you know, and get the job done. Really, I think that's probably the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. And probably a lot of Marines would say that, and maybe a lot of people who've been in the military would say that. I think. Yeah, that's a bit of a trailer to where we're headed in your career but let's go to the next stepping yeah. zone so you finish with the marines yeah you're interested in shifting gears a little bit as you mentioned on our pre-call you said you get bored easily yeah so what's the next lily pad for you 
I just wanted to do something in fitness. You know, I wanted to be a, a PTI, physical training instructor. But in the Marines, you had to have a certain amount of rank. I, I got mm. to the rank of corporal, but then the, the trade of PTI, that they have to have enough jobs available, and they just weren't available. And I just didn't want to keep hanging about, and I didn't want to keep doing back-to-back tours of, of places. And I just got a bit, I suppose I got a little bit fed up, really. And I'd done 10 years, and I, I had seen um people that are probably my age now leave and they were fantastic soldiers but they were leaving to go into civilian life and they didn't have any qualifications they didn't have any anything to offer well they didn't realize they had any they had plenty to offer but at that mm-hmm. time they didn't have degrees and things like that so a lot of them were doing things like and there's nothing wrong with these jobs but they were doing hgb driving security and i thought i don't want to do that so I thought I need to get qualified, you know, I need to get sorted. So I went and did a, uh, a course to be, to become a PT, you know, physical training, um, personal trainer. And, and that's where I headed. And I went and did that. And then I left the Marines and then set up as a PT. And I had, um, as a PT and a sports therapist, I had two, I set up two clinics um, and I ran two clinics. So I was treating um, clients and patients for, sort of minor sporting injuries and also training people in the gym um and i enjoyed that and then the company that i actually did the course with because i did very well on the course they then asked me if i wanted to be one of their tutors so i then worked tutoring it for a while which i really enjoyed and it was on that mm. course that i met a guy who was in the army um and he was trained to be an osteopath um and that the guy now I still know him. His name's Carl Todd, Dr. Carl Todd. He's the um, he's actually the, the England soccer osteopath at the moment. So, and he works for we have, we have the Premier League in soccer over here. So he works for a lot of the Premier League teams. So he inspired me to then go and study osteopathy because I thought, well, I was seeing a few people that some of the injuries I couldn't quite deal with, and I was like, well, I don't know what to do. And I just thought, I'm going to send them to an osteopath. I don't know why. <laughs> and then eventually I thought, well, why don't I just do it? <laughs> right, yeah. So that was it. Um, I went um, I went back to college, but I didn't get straight in because, of course, I left school at 15. So I had to go and do some night school first to get the grades to get into the to, to, to do the degree. So that, that was what I did. And how long was that schooling for you to receive your program in, in osteopath that, medicine? That was a five-year. Wow. It was five years, yeah. Um, so that was in Lon- London at the British School of Osteopathy. So I did a five-year degree um, and then graduated in um, 2005. And you started to hit the ground running, ultimately yeah. building out your own clinic, correct? Yeah. I mean, I again, because I was at that time, I was now I was sort of one of the older ones on the course because when you start a degree, you might be 18 mm-hmm. as I was starting my degree at 25, 24, um, 25. And, um, so I was quite mature, very mature, actually having spent 10 years in the Marines. So I wasn't right. into the, I wasn't, I'd already done the drinking and the fighting and everything else. I didn't <laughs> need to do it again. So I just really hammered that. And then in the last year I was putting things in place for when I graduated. So, I already had jobs and, and stuff set up. So when I graduated, I think a lot of the guys took, as they do, they take a year out because, you know, it's all too much and I need mm-hmm. a year off to relax. I just, I just went for it. <laughs> and then within probably, actually within four days, I was, I was seeing patients as an osteopath um, wow. and building it up from there. Yeah. And, that, and that's where it went. And um, we were working down in the Southern part of England for a while and I was working for a I was working for it's quite an interesting story. I was working for an osteopath who was 99 years old. 99. Yeah. And um he had he had graduated um under one of the founders of osteopathic medicine. What? Um, one of the founders of osteopathic medicine or one of the key figures was a guy called John Martin Little John. And John Martin Little John trained in Kirksville, Missouri under the, the founder of a of osteopathy which is dr at still um and the at still university is obviously still in um still in kirksville missouri and they're, they're still um training osteopathic physicians so 
my teacher had, had sort of trained. So I went and I went and worked under him as his assistant. So we used to have um, people come from all over the world to see this this 99 year old. And he was like on fire because he was 99, but he was seeing, you know, 10, 11 patients a day. And, wow. and I was just glued to his side because I wanted to learn everything that um, he could teach me because he was the link to the roots of osteopathic medicine. And it was later on in my career in osteopathy that I, and we mentioned this, I, I, I've, I've taught at Kirksville College. I went back and um, I went and demonstrated um, and um, I spoke to quite a few of the old timers there. There was a guy mm. there who was 101 <laughs> and his name was, he's passed away now, but he, his name was Dr. Farnham and he graduated un, under, um, not not directly under 80 still, but his father had, had graduated under 80 still. But he'd graduated in 1936 and I spent like two or three hours just chatting to him about osteopathy. And I, I was just, I was just, like obsessed with it um one of the reasons why i went over there was because i'd seen in one of the early journals which was 1900 a treatment chair that dr still had made and i asked the um jason haxton who's the curator of the museum um in kirks or the osteopathic museum if they had one of these chairs and he said no but if we did it'd be like one of the holy grails so wow. i built one and um, in fact, I built two and I then went on a road trip with my brother um, across the States with this chair <laughs> and then presented it at a big conference. It was workable. You, you, know, you can adjust people on the chair. It's called the AT Steel Treating Chair. I've got one here, actually, my one. And I, and I donated the other one to the museum. So if you ever go to the Museum of Osteopathic Medicine in Kirksville, you'll see... Dr. A.T. Steele's treatment chair. And underneath it, you'll say built. It'll say built by Jamie Archer. <laughs> That's incredible. Wow. So, anyway, that, 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 that was a bit roundabout. But anyway, that's who I worked. I worked with this old timer. And I, I worked with him until he passed away. And then mm. I, I moved up to the middle of England, which is where I am, where I am now. So. Yeah, so talk to us a little bit about having a clinic attached to your residence where you can literally just go through a door and you're on the other side in your clinic what is that like for you that's awesome you know it's like super easy really i mean we we saw this clinic for sale when when i was working down south and we came and have a look at it and it's like it's like a four bed house with a with a clinic attached to the side and obviously mm. there's a a doorway like a secret doorway from my home <laughs> into the clinic which is like an old cupboard where there's like shoes and things. <laughs> it's a bit booby trapped actually because every time we go in something falls on my head you can like hear me swearing and, and cursing and then i sort of appear out the other side it's like super osteopath you know? <laughs> and then the kids are like daddy's going backwards and forwards in and out so we have this clinic so it's got separate entrance so of course in the morning i get ready i go through, the, through there and i'm in my clinic and it's, it's not massive. We've got two treatment rooms, a waiting area, toilet, all that sort of thing, and mm -hmm. um, big parking area out front, and people come and, and see me. So um, we've been here for um, since 2007, So, mm. and we built it up to quite a, quite a um, successful high volume for, for osteopathy anyway, because osteopathy is slightly different to chiropractic. The osteopaths don't tend to have high volume practices. Mm -hmm. The chiropractors do, but... But this one is quite a high volume practice for an osteopath. So we see people, anyone and everyone with all sorts of things, um, you know, but obviously mainly a lot of spinal type things. Wow. And one of your main specialties, obviously, from your experience being an athlete, being in the Marines and yeah. working with other athletes is focusing on athletes. So talk to us a little bit about the tactical athlete side and how you've merged these two worlds to develop your own platform to help this type of a population. Yeah. So I, you know, cause often when you see athletes, when I, whenever I see athletes, um, so let's say sort of track and field athletes first, a, a lot of them I'm seeing are, are injured and, um, they can be quite young and, and they're getting good coaching in a sense of technical advice, but they haven't got the, they haven't got the foundation 
the movement foundation, the strength foundation. I mean, strength underpins everything, doesn't it? So mm-hmm. they haven't got that. So with an osteopathic biomechanical eye, you can pick a lot of that up. You can see weaknesses, restrictions, um, you know, all these sorts of things, and you can you can build on that. And that's what I do with my with my athletes. With with tactical athletes, it's quite big over here. The term tactical athlete, and um, it, it's really people that either in or wanting to get into or just want to be like military law enforcement fire service because these men and women are for me they're the ultimate all-rounders they really are because Mm -hmm. and it's functional in the sense that they've got to do it for their job you know they have to they have to sprint across the battlefield they have to walk you know 30 miles with heavy kit on they have to jump over that wall they have to climb up that rope they have to lift up that heavy thing that's all the things that we did in the marines but it was never called tactical athletes. We just did it. Mm-hmm. But when I look back, we were training in that way. So lots of people, for example, young lads that want to join the Royal Marines, the first thing they try and do is they try and put a heavy pack on and start walking miles, which, of course, breaks them down. They're just not ready for that. And that's a big, big mistake. I mean, when I joined the Marines, we didn't put a heavy pack on for several weeks. Mm. We were built up slowly. So part of it is is strength and conditioning and getting people the right um, foundation and platform to build on. Obviously, education in how they can look after their bodies and how they can manage problems if they do have problems, but also having programs, designing programs that develop all around athleticism, you know, so you're not just, it's not heavy on one thing because in the military, And it's the same in the States. A lot of it is top heavy on endurance. It's all, I think they call it rucking over there. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, you've got to be a sprinter. You've got to be a power athlete. You know, you've got to have agility. Um, It's not all linear. It's it's sideways movement. And and it's it's so transferable in in all sorts of things. And it's more fun. So I have a, um, I put together a digital um, online training group, uh, which is called Tactical Tactical Athlete, um, and I people can join, and it's a monthly fee, and uh, I send them training programs, advice, and they have they have access to me through an app. Mm. Um, they have they download on their phones, and um, we make it fun, and then they can go and do whatever they want to do, um, whether it's join the military or do a military type um, event. So, for example, over here in the UK, we have a military event that is a um, it's a route march that's made famous by the SAS called the Fan Dance. Um, there's a mountain in Wales in the Brecon Beacons called Penny Fan, and it's a famous mountain where the SAS selection takes place. So if people want to do that. They want a little taste of of special forces selection. So right, yeah. what you have to do is you have to put on a heavy backpack and you have to literally, you know, ruck it up the hill and back again in a in a time so they need to know how to train for that so that's the sort of thing really it's good fun and, and you know it's good training rucking gets you fit but you've got to be fit to ruck as they say so so what's interesting about this is your interest in fitness and conditioning ultimately leads you back to school again and now you're studying strength and conditioning so talk to us a little bit about how you're intending to weave that into your practice as an osteopath but also training these tactical athletes and just humans in general. Yeah. I mean, I was finding that with the osteopathy, for example, I was doing what like a lot of osteopaths and actually what like a lot of therapists do. It was like all about the therapy. You know, osteopathy is the most amazing thing ever and everyone should have it. But it was, wasn't long before I realized that it's just a piece of the pie. You know, Mm -hmm. you can't take on people's health for them. You have to give them, you have to empower them to do other things. So with my, and with osteopathic um, training, we, we touched on physical fitness and strength and conditioning, but not a lot. That's a, that's an added extra. So, but with my knowledge, I was finding that I could help people a lot more by you know, exercise prescription, rehab, prehab, all the things that come with it. So that was making my successes better. So um, and I've always loved that. That goes all the way back to being that 15 year old wanting to join as a physical training instructor. Mm. And I, but when I was 15, there was no such thing as a degree in strength and conditioning. Um, 
but there is now. And of course, strength and conditioning isn't, it's not personal training, it's not workouts, it's it's training people for performance for a certain mm-hmm. goal, mm-hmm. not just training for training's sake. So I wasn't interested in toning up or getting some abs or making your biceps <laughs> 16 inches. I wanted to know, you know, do you want to do this? Do you want to join that? Do you want to run a mile in four minutes? That's what I'm interested in. So that's training with performers and athletes. So when I, um, when I was sort of, again, getting itchy feet a few, a couple of years ago, and certainly over this lockdown, I thought, right, time to do something else again. And um, I did a, I've done a, um, a level four coaching. So I'm a certified strength and conditioning coach, but I wanted more. Mm. So I, um, I applied and got accepted to, to start a degree, a master's degree in strength and conditioning in London in September. So I'm really excited about that because not only is that going to help me in my osteopathy, it's going to help me with a, a new career path in strength and conditioning and um, maximizing performance. So I think what I might be doing is rather than being an osteopath, there's also a strength and conditioning coach. I think I might be a strength and conditioning coach who is also an osteopath. Mm. Um, and my osteopathic knowledge will help me immensely in helping my athletes to perform to their best ability. And um, as I was saying the other day, I, I've got a new job coaching um, strength and conditioning and rugby, uh, elite rugby in a in an independent school here in the UK. And I'm excited to do that because that's the first rungs on the ladder of just another another new step for me. So I'm excited. Yeah, I wanted to I wanted to ask a little bit more about that. I know on the pre-call you mentioned this job that's starting in September yeah. along with your program itself being in strength conditioning. Yeah. What are your intentions for those athletes and what do you plan to bring them? I know you have a load of experience being in the Marines and as a successful yeah. osteopath. But what is it that yeah. you plan to to give them moving forward? I'm going when I the head of sport at this at this um this academy again is is very interested in like a lot of actual heads of sports and directors of sport is keeping their athletes healthy and mm-hmm. um, you know we we can all put together training programs we can all tell you to do this or do that but it's um reducing the amount of injuries as i said before improving uh, um, uh, the athletic ability of of the of the, girl, the girls and boys uh, which of course leads to success because mm-hmm. you know, these, these places are, they want success. They want trophies, they want medals, they want things like that. So um, we're going to be putting together um, strength and conditioning, but we're going to be going way back, way back to um, movement assessments, um, performance assessments. So we're going to have measurable criteria. So, you know, it's going to be, everything's going to be measured, which is the big thing, obviously in SNC at the moment, everything's measured, everything's checked, um, everything's assessed. So we can then sort of move forward with the right thing. So um, I will be coaching track and field uh, and predominantly rugby, but I will be, um, yes, I'll be coaching the tactical aspects of that and the technical, but also I'll be um, hopefully improving those um, athletes, those a- that athletic ability, that athleticism in them, and also reducing the injuries um, and also managing the ones that do have injuries because what we don't want is people breaking down um, mid-season, you know, and out right. for six weeks yeah. um, or whatever it is. doesn't matter who you are. Even with the best medical care, you're out for six weeks so or, or longer. So we don't want that. So we need something in place that we can try and reduce that. We can't prevent injuries. We can't prevent them, but we can certainly try and reduce them and then, um, you know, rehab people so they come back better and stronger because, what we don't want is repeated episodes of the same problem, which is what I see in my practice um, where people, they just deal in pain. So they think because the pain has gone, the problems disappear. But of course, that's only the beginning. So what we want is, um, is, is people being rehabbed all the way through and the true healing and then the functional ability of coming back in our athletes. Um, my old osteopath, <laughs> the guy who was 99, he always used to say to me, he used to say, do not tell me that you made the patient feel better. I'm not interested that you made them feel better. Anybody can make anybody feel better. 
It's not about pain. We are not dealing with pain. Osteopaths are not treating pain. We mm. are working on function. And wow. the pain is a side issue. If we improve the function, the strength, the power, the elasticity, the mobility, the pain will often reduce anyway as a side issue. But if you yeah. start chasing pain around people's body, then you're lost, just lost. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to be working on. I'm excited. Because, yeah, it sounds like um, it. The guy that is the head, he's, I'm going to be learning off him because I'm, I want to learn off other people. I've always done that. I want to mm -hmm. find the people that know their stuff and you know ask them as many questions as I can and, and, and learn. So. Well, speaking of people that know their stuff, let's add this last layer in there. Tomorrow you're going into an interesting opportunity with Bear Grylls. For yeah, so the yeah. listeners who don't know who he is, that's a problem for them. But let's just share a little <laughs> yeah. bit about what you've got going on as a mountain leader working with his company and yeah. taking this information into a corporate setting. Yeah. So, again, I mean, I, I'm always looking to do other things. And then um, this opportunity came along to work with um, the Bear Grylls Academy, Survival Academy. So um, this, is a, this is an academy I work as, a, as an instructor um, for the Bear Grylls Academy. So what we do is, um, this is a corporate event I'm doing, but we also work with, with anyone. But we use um, leadership, team building, um, physical testing to help sort of get the best out of, out of people. So this event that we have tomorrow is a corporate event for, for a, a major company in London um, where myself and two other instructors will be taking a day of, as I say, leadership skills in order to help their company um, improve in sort of, I suppose, the cutthroat world of, you know, business. <laughs> it's, it's the same sort of thing. It's, you know, whether it's high level sport, high level business, so we'll be putting um, these people through sort of stressful situations and making them make decisions in stressful situations. I mean, in fun, it's fun. Right. But um, and and, it'll, and they'll they'll love it. There'll be a lot of ice break, you know, ice breaking stuff because when you first get to there, everybody sort of stood at the corner and I wants to join in. But the good thing about <laughs> the Bear Grylls Academy is um, he was obviously a former Special Forces soldier. His father, uh, Bear Grylls' father, for those of you who don't know, was was a Royal Marines commando as well. Bear Grylls is is linked to the Royal Marines, so. And a lot of the lessons that we're going to teach them tomorrow are straight out of the military book, but can go straight into the corporate book. You know, as I said, leadership, decision making. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be doing, um, we're going to be throwing axes. We're going to be stalking. We're going to be camouflaging up. We're going to be uh, firing rifles. We're going to be jumping in and out of rivers. We're going to be doing river crossing. We're going to be navigating at night in the dark. Um, we're going to be uh, doing uh, observational stuff or memory type stuff. Uh, we're going to be doing knot tying um, and then we're going to be doing casualty evacuations whilst I'm going to be throwing smoke grenades and rockets at them. <laughs> so there's going to be lots of whiz, bangs and pops as they're going to be trying to tie knots. And it's exactly what we, in a, in a way, what we did in the, in the Marines. You know, you've got all sorts of stimuli coming into you, but mm -hmm. you've got to focus on the task in hand. And that could be, you know, that, that crosses over in a corporate world, it crosses over in, a, in an elite world. If you're competing, mm -hmm. you know, you're in the stadium, there's all sorts of distractions going on. So I'm looking forward to it. They're, they're good fun. It's good fun. There's a lot of um, things that we do with the Bear Grylls. That's just one of them. We also do stuff up in Scotland and um, abroad as well. So I, I'm involved in that. And my Again, my 10 years in the Royal Marines comes in very handy uh, for that. So. I bet. <laughs> Jamie, this is awesome. Just walking through your career and into what you're getting into now, it just seems super exciting and very fruitful. And who knows what's next, right? You could start with this rugby Absolutely. team and then you've got going on Bear Grylls and then you've got yeah. this degree you're finishing. I mean, you know, a year or two from now, you might have something else under your belt and I wouldn't be surprised. But I do want to thank you for taking the time to join Preform. It's been a joy hearing about your story and your career. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Are you ready to optimize? Perform Humans is the evidence-based approach to optimal performance, health, and well-being. Visit performhumans.com for more information.